Aloha and welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center's An Afternoon with the Author. My name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the Executive Director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, where our mission is to inspire people to find the hero within themselves through the legacy of our Nisei veterans. Uh, you can find out more information about our center on our website at nvmc.org. We're so glad that all of you have joined in today to hear a really engaging talk story with author Lois Ann Yamanaka. We will, I'll be introducing her in just a minute, um, but to all of our regular viewers, we say welcome back. We love having you engaged in our various talks. And to those who are new with us today, thanks for being here. And we really hope that uh, this isn't the last time that we, that we see you. Uh, we can't technically see you, but you can see us. I um, just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping items uh, while people are still trickling into the webinar. Number one, wanted to let you know that if you do have questions through Alpha Talk, feel free to put send those in. There's a little question and answer button at the bottom left of your screen. So send those in and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available on our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center YouTube channel in about a week and a half. Uh, so we encourage you to go there, um, share it with colleagues, friends, uh, other book club members, as well as linger for a little while and check out some of the other talks that we have done. Uh, third, this, uh, you'll all be receiving our weekly Wednesday updates. This is an email that comes into your inbox around two o'clock every Wednesday, just letting you know what is happening here at the center, who our upcoming speakers are. So of course you can unsubscribe at any time. We realize you get oodles of emails, um, but we hope you stay engaged uh, because we would love for you to be part of our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Ohana. And last but not least, we couldn't be able to provide this series or our Take leadership series. Uh, we couldn't do the work that we do in our archives or here at the Education Center if it weren't for the tremendous corporate support we get from our uh, corporate sponsors. So please help me mahalo Housemart, Central Pacific Bank Foundation, VIP Food Service, Maui Health Systems, Haisha Hawaii, Maui Sons and Daughters of the Nisei Veterans, Service Rentals, Arizumi Brothers, Abbey Carpet of Maui, TJ's Warehouse, Mid-Pacific Pest Control, Maui Disposal, Pural Water Specialty Company, Say Design, Munikio Haraga, RT Tanaka Engineers, and The Maui News. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. Now, for the reason you all tuned in, it gives me really a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ms. Lois Ann Yamanaka. A Molokai girl, Lois Ann Yamanaka taught English, drama, and speech for 12 years with the Department of Education. She was named one of the 25 most influential Asians in America by A Magazine and was listed among those who shaped the aisles in this century, 100 who made a difference by the Honolulu Star Bulletin. She is the recipient of the Hawaii Award for Literature, the American Book Award, the Children's Choice for Literature, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. She is the author of Snow Angel, Sand Angel, Saturday Night at the Pahala Theater, Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers, Blues Hanging, Heads by Harry, Name Me Nobody, Father of the Four Passages, and Behold the Many. She is a graduate of Hilo High School. Many of her literary works are written in Hawaiian pidgin, and some of her writing has dealt with controversial ethnic issues. In particular, her works confront themes of Asian American families and the local culture of Hawaii. Her first novel, Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers, was adapted into a movie titled Fishbowl by the acclaimed uh, late Hawaiian filmmaker Keo Hata. 
both Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers and Saturday Night at the Paula Theatre have been produced as plays by Kumu Kahua Theatre over on Oahu. Please help me give a very warm Maui welcome to Ms. Lois Ann Yamanaka. Hey. Hi, Lois. Ta -da! Ann. Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Good. You know that's a lie, but that's okay. That's a, you know what? <laughs> it's uh it's just more polite to go to go with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it makes everybody feel good. But uh, mm -hmm. we are so glad that you're with us today. I can't tell you how much I, I love this book. And for everybody who is on the call today, if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, go out and purchase it. Uh it's it's wonderful. It touches every single emotion and uh, made me laugh hysterically a couple places and uh, <laughs> cry and everything else. But thanks for being here with us today. And we thought, um, if you're okay with it, maybe you could just kick off the talk today by um, doing a little, uh, doing a reading. Okay. I'm going to start with a piece that I, um, I wrote in the voice of the father of the narrator. And he, uh, and this piece is called No Ninjas, Farmers, or Wannabes in This Family. Everybody here, every Japanese city from samurai family back in Japan. Samurai, my ass, my father says, all a bunch of rice farmers who went straight from the stinking paddies to the damn plantation for a dollar a day, broke the ass work. Oh, your whole life to the plantation general store. No more money. Got to charge, charge, charge. All the meat even. And we're talking Vienna sausage and canned corn beef. And everybody there is damn rice farmer. So the holy owner, he treats you like one dog. I promise, even his own dog even sleep better than us. But our family, he says, we from Samurai Line. This the story that Uncle Tora told me he would treat us all the way back to Russia. We rush in, you know, but not the white kind. And my father tells me this story every time we take a long drive to the countryside. Long time ago, there was an uprising against the Shogun plan by the Lord Tyra. Lord Tyra, he was very shrewd and smart, so he convinced our family rise up with him. Our clan, samurai, of course. We follow the Lord Tyra, we get wiped out. Everybody in the Tyra clan has to commit seppuku. And our clan got to live on a very small island off your nice city called Heigun. On that island, they get incest because only family live there. Incest! Oh, except Pogama, who escaped the island of Heigun and come to Hawaii. Yeah, right, Samurai. Easy escape. How come? Sure, Daddy. Sure. You watch your lip, girl, because you're talking to a man whose ancestors rose up against the Shogun. No, we ain't no ninja family like your Kiku TV shows, no Sunny Chibas or Makos or Yagyu Jube in this family like on your low-class ninja, sh ninja shows. And we ain't no rice farmers either with their chacha rice and daikon for dinner. Samurai, I tell you. Samurai. Miyamoto, Masashi. And Zatoishi, all the way. Our mourn is on the palace walls at one castle in Himeji. I seen our own family crest with my own two eyes when I went to Japan. Grandma, too, with her own two eyes before she died. She seen her mother's own family crest right there in stone. Samurai, kid. And don't you ever forget it. Then my father says this to me when he's fed up. When I get something expensive, where I don't even take care of even small things. We had no car. We had no TV, no nothing. I walked two miles, no five miles, no 10 miles to school in the rain, barefooted. I, we sleep all in the same room. Rice parchment pillow, rice bag sheets. I wore all my brother's shirts passed down to me. No candy, no ice cream, never. Yeah, kid, you want to be this, you want to be that. I send you piano lessons, you quit. You didn't come cheap. I send you to another teacher, you quit. Lose money, I tell you. Then I send you city and county summer fun. You call them summer junk just because it was free. So in class, eh, just quit. 
I was picking flowers double time for that class and helping Jeffrey burn electrical wire the weekend. God want it. You want to be something, then you better learn how to stick to it. Me, I was a young boy growing up in the rice camp. I want a job. I'm 10 years old. And you know what job I get? I digging up the gobo on the side of the mill. Some for my mother feed the family, 15 kids, no fancy food. Most I sell them. I dig that gobo all day. I 10 years old and I hurry up all the time. One time I tell you, I had the sickest thing happen to me. My mother tell me go store or buy her bread with the gobo money. I sit thinking, Ah, maybe I'll buy me one Hershey's bar with the gobo money I win make. So I take the bread to the counter and the Hershey's too. The store owner, he add them up. And I don't wanna hold my hands to shame, take the candy back to the shelf. I sitting on the bench outside wishing for an orange soda. Then the tip top bakery man come for delivery and that damn ass. He throw the day old pastries at the store owners. Why am I right now hunting dogs? My mouth never did taste one pastry like that till after I left the damn camp. Before, uh, I want to be a vet veterinarian and I smart. Even though I don't talk too much in school days, I know I smart. But the plantation owners, they make us think we dumb, man. We no can do nothing but stay on the plantation. Me, I write to my big sister in Milwaukee. I beg her, send me to out of the plantation, please, please. But when I get there, I work in one factory. Because even if I know I'm smart, I think I'm dumb. You know what I'm saying? Then my holy friend, he want to be one biologist. He take me night class with him. Me, I'm smart, but I think I'm dumb. But I figure, ah, what the heck? Hey, I came out more smart than him. More better grades. No can talk good like him in class, uh, but when the tests come back, who get the higher grade? That's right. That's how I came one college student. And you, you want to be this, you want to be that. Well, you better learn how to talk like one howly like me. Yes, sir. I will really appreciate this job. What a nice spell of weather we're having here. Oh, yes, sir. I'm a hardworking individual. Yes, I do believe I'm quite qualified for this vocation. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I am quite capable of speaking the holy vernacular. You know what I said? You know what I mean? I said you damn right I can talk straight English because kiddo, it ain't easy out there. It's a man's world and it's a howling man's world. So you better shape up, stick to it, stick Stick to something, anything. I tell you, you gotta practice starting from now. Throw the ball, play the game. They think you smart, but they think you dumb. Then you be like me, eh, hey, you go along, you go along, you go along. And then when you get on by the ball, and that bugger ready to throw the pastries to the dogs, little girl, you twist so hard. So, thank you. That's my dad. <laughs> so, um, first of all, have you ever thought of doing a an audiobook? You know, I've been approached several times, but it was just never the right um, time. And I would love to do an audiobook. Yeah. I um, Bamboo Ridge has a tape of my Saturday night, and I found when I practice on my little tape recorder that I have to exaggerate like 10 times more because it's only voice but i'd love to do that yeah but you know, we had offers never did so uh you know you are this very prolific writer you are you do poetry you do novels but um what i thought was really interesting is i read that you didn't actually start out uh to be a writer and uh, I think that's maybe surprising for some of our viewers. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? I mean, I knew I wanted to be a writer. My grandma is a Southern Baptist. She was a founding member of Conoco Baptist Church, Maui County. <laughs> and so she, um, she said that God gave me a gift and that I would get a calling. I knew what my gift was. But um, when I was little, the only person who was writing stories about Hawaii was Ruth Tabra. 
So she wrote um, Emily's Hawaii. It, it was Hawaiian Heart before that. She wrote The Red Shark. I read it over and over. You know, when you don't see a facsimile of yourself in literature, you don't exist. So for me, I knew I wanted to write, but I would make myself into a character from Chicago and I'd be white and then I would have a dog and I never saw snow, but I would play in the snow. It was just so disingenuous. So, um, so I was a teacher already and um, we had the privilege of poets in the schools, Eric Chaw. So a big chunk of our department money went to having him in residence. And you know, when my students wrote those poems that he, I mean, they made me cry. You know, the ones that were so hard to discipline and they were so vicious. Um, you, I got to understand why through their poetry. And I said, you know what? I only went, the only eighth grade, I got a master's degree. What the heck am I doing? I want to be a writer. So I went back to school. I went back to the university at age 27. And I met the most wonderful mentor on that journey. Really? She um, actually turned in my poems. I wasn't even going to publish. So the impulse really? to write came from Eric Chalk said, uh, poetry is free therapy. I, know. She was, I mean, it wasn't funny, okay? But it's true. It's free therapy. And um, I was doing it for that, that, you know? And then she submitted it to Bamboo Ridge and they published my first poem. And that was your first, that was your first book. That was your first published yeah, and eventually I submitted so many poems. They said, hey, you got more of these, like we can make a book. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And so it wasn't until, I think, so Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers was your actual first novel that you, right, right. that you got with, but you had been published earlier with your, with your poetry. Um, you know, you were, you were talking a little bit when you were doing your monologue, you said that, you know, that's your dad is, is there an autobiographical part to to the book or to you know to any of your books but specifically to the wild meat and the bully burgers the uh impetus for a story starts with a kernel of truth there has to be truth in the story but sometimes like a story that i will write will be the kernel and i can tell it as it is like joy kogawa did um obasan obachang obasan Canadian Japanese she was molested as a child so she used the whole kernel as the story but for me life is just too mundane so you gotta fictionalize and use your greater imagination to composite people and times and places and events so that's how I do my work there was another question connected to that, but you know, lately I've been losing my thoughts. It was something about, oh, what happened to Laurie, Lovey and Jerry? I told you this, yeah? Yeah, I, I love, we were talking the other day yeah. and um, you know, you, you started talking about your Jerry character yeah. who is actually based on a friend yes. and kind of shared that story. Um, I loved it. Would you, yeah. would you, do you feel comfortable sharing yeah. that? I base uh, the character Jerome on of course, it's a composite so that he cannot ever sue me because if you find yourself in somebody's book and you can prove that to you, you can sue them. So I always composite characters and the Jerry characters are composite of several of my, uh, my gay friends and he, um, what you call that? So he was kind of like a pariah and then I was like his best friend and I had like a Tony perm and frizzy hair and fat and you know, so he, so we were kind of like on the outskirts of life. So um, when we graduated, uh, what our, I think it was our 10th year, no, it was our 20th year reunion. We were the photo op, right? So Don, oops, there's his name. So anyway, me and Jerry, uh, I did a reading in New York City and then he met me in the bar. I was ready to go to, on to the next city and he was so busy, so we met in the bar, and then um, the the driver 
the chauffeur, you know, with that hat and the whole nine yards. He calls and says, Mr. Yamanaka, I'm going to take you to the airport. So my friend says, hey, can I catch a ride to 104? So she says, oh, okay, come. I'll drop you off. It's on our way. So then me and Don get, oops, me and him get into this long black stretch limousine with all, you know, the liquor and the champagne. And he said, oh, enjoy. It was like two twintas sitting in the back. And then he said, um, so what happened to Lovey and Jerry at the end of the story? I said, well, they got into, Lovey became a writer and Jerry became a stylist that was the fashion editor of Italian Vogue and now freelances as a stylist and makes tons of money. And they got into a stretch limo on Fifth Avenue and they drove off into the sunset together. <laughs> I love that. And you were you were talking earlier, um, well, when we were talking this past week about how you had kind of given him the manuscript to to read yeah. ahead of time, and he was reading it on the airplane and was just you know busting, yeah. laughing. And, he said um, it was so embarrassing because he couldn't stop, and he and he laughs like a horse, you know, like he used to laugh like Arnold Horshack, if you remember that character, but. It's kind of a tame Arnold Horshack now, but he was reading the galley proofs of wild meat and he was laughing. He was on a flight from New York to Milan. And then he said, and people started giving him strange looks. So he would have to stop reading and then gather himself together. And, you know, I was, yeah. I, I, I was so happy that he, he approved of what I had done. Yeah. Um. Uh, one of the questions I had was, you know, when I was reading the book, um, it just brought me back to being <laughs> 16 years old again. And it was, um, you made me remember things that I had forgotten. You seem to have this incredible talent to really tap into those youthful feelings and those those memories of youth and you know where where does that where does that come from i mean t did you write diaries as a young girl and then mm. refer back to those feelings where does that come from because it's, it's quite a talent you know like uh i talk to a other writers and i and musicians and you know like uh it, it's a place that's uh that um that is below uh reverend aoki said that it's below 2020 so you're at 2040 and you go beyond the veil the metaphorical veil but you tie yourself so that you can come back into but you go into this this is andrea segovia a three-dimensional place where you lose time so you you, you start working at one and you go, oh five o'clock i gotta cook the rice and you gotta come back but that's where that stuff is it's out there and then when you come back the first thing that I have to do is I have to grab a pen and write down all the different things that I remembered and saw. And it's a process of constant collection of random. So I used to write on like, I would just grab a paper because an idea came, oh, my goat, my goat went die. So I got to write it down because the thoughts go like this and la like that. And dreams are like that too. So everywhere I am, there's a pad of post-its and a pen and then there's a journal for every book that I am working on and I know whose story I just remembered on the gum wrapper and the good thing about me switching to post-its instead of random paper is that they stick to everything so even if it doesn't stick in your bag you'll find it and then when I come home I'll stick it in the journal that I'm using to write that particular book. But they you, come in the car when you drive, you know what I mean? And you really? gotta write it down, yeah. Oh, they come to you. It seems that they, they, they come to you. Are they, um, do you have to be in a particular space when you are writing, you know, when you embark on a new novel? I, I know you're doing just a children's book, uh -huh. um, but, when that happens, do you have to close out everything else 
around you? Are you able mm. to go between the, the two worlds? Mm, no. So I don't navigate that well. There are only a few people who can enter because it's a sacred space, you know, like I build, the first thing I do is I build an altar. So my most recent altar was all these pieces of sandalwood. They were like uh, end tables and they were like, I put all the different people and pictures and tchotchke and all kinds of things that I put a big cross on the top. I put my daddy there, my son. So, and then I build the altar. And then um, when I begin writing, I pray myself in so that I can be um, protected because of going beyond the veil, you just so like not safe, you know, like it's a not, not a safe thing to do. That's why people think writing is easy, you know, like my husband, how much did you wrote today? My ex-husband. Oh, um, I found one word and he said, that's all you did today? I said, yeah. I said, you think Picasso painted every day? And he said, who made you Picasso? I said, oh yeah, no. <laughs> but beyond the veil, and then my son, because he's, um, he's autistic, his presence is not intrusive. It's a, almost a spirit-like presence and he'll come in and he can wander in. But if somebody with real strong energy comes in it just kind of like uh it i i don't i don't like that <laughs> at all but there are certain people that can come in and come out and out it doesn't bother and then i close it so i close the opening i close the channel so that i don't leave myself vulnerable you know to anything that cannot dive in me and make any kind to me <laughs> um interesting and then what do you what do you do when you are when you are done with that creation, when you're done with that book, does that altar still remain in your in your heart? Do you physically take it down, but is it always is it always with you? The altar will eventually come down because every book has its own kind of vibe that I need to make. And then the altar will be will transform itself into something else. And then I've seen other writers alters. Um, Norman Duby, I mean, get Christmas lights and all kinds of chili pepper um, lights. And you can see the detail in his altar of people and places and important messages that somebody wrote to you on a piece of paper. And I found it just so fascinating. And there's a book called Altars of Grace that um, writers the, they, I don't know, I do that. And I was kind of surprised that everybody else did that too, but I thought I was special. But um, the closing of a book, I take a long time like this. I stand over the period and then I take a deep breath and I thank God and I thank Jesus and the journey is not over, but I will now end up poop. Wow. And then this whole hallelujah choir of angels sing. And no matter what time of day it is, I'm going to pop the bottle of wine that I predicted the day that I would end. So I'm going to pop my wine. If somebody's available, like, you know, most guys are at work at the time. So, uh, but then I might have a friend, you know, like uh, another writer friend. Hey, I just finished my book. You like drink. <laughs> drink, me, drink with me. We got to celebrate my book. I have to have that drink. And then when I send it out of my house to uh, my agent, what I do is I have another ceremony where I say goodbye to my child. They're going to college. I cannot control what you do in the world. I cannot control what others think of you, do to you. I, there's nothing. I cannot be in the classroom with you. I, you become your own entity. You are something I need, but not that I, I got to let you go. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's obviously a very personal, a very personal journey for you, mm -hmm. um, for all authors, I, I guess. You know, a lot of your topics are, are difficult topics. Um, mm -hmm. You and you write about them so, so personally and, and with such care. And some of your topics are controversial. And I'm, I, I, I don't know if I'm phrasing this correctly, but. 
in, in your novels or in your poetry, do you write for an end goal of being controversial, maybe to get a dialogue happening? Or do you write about seemingly difficult or controversial topics in order to give a voice to those who may be overlooked? Yeah, you know, um, I don't think that I sought out to be controversial, but what happened was I started with three rules. And the first is I will never let anybody censor me again and tell me that I'm inadequate because I cannot speak standard English. Never again. It's institutional racism, you know what I mean? And we didn't know, we couldn't name the oppressor. Like, who, who, why are we feeling this way, you know? So um, the second one was that I would never censor myself again, never. So anybody can tell me anything. You can call me the reincarnation of Japanese soldiers who when, you know, uh, in, in the Philippines and uh, soft, uh, hardcore pornography. And people have, I mean, I've, my, I have felt my life in danger, um, but, but the thing is that I don't censor myself and I don't let others censor me. And the last one was give back generously to the gift as generously as the gift has been given to me. So I can go and talk to a class of sophomores at Marino High School and I get a bag of cookies or I'm going to get paid a thousand dollars because I'm going to be hot. So it doesn't matter, you know, like it's not about money. It's about giving back to the gift and, you know, wanting to give ourselves a face in literature. And you give to and you give to those voices that um, may be misunderstood or not seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, someone just uh, wrote in a little question asking uh, why why that title? Why why Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers? I mean, I know it's one of the I think yeah. it's the eleventh the eleventh chapter um, uh -huh. in the book, <laughs> but why did you pick that one as the title? My father, in real life, my father is a taxidermist. He was also a school administrator, photographer, stone carver, artist, painter. He, he traveled the world three times. My father is a Renaissance man and um, wild meat and the bully burgers are <laughs> because we always had hunters over at the house in the afternoon, they skinning the goats and, and we just, what are we playing? And then he, he, he takes out a baby goat and then it's on my, uh, the line between beauty and violence. And the little baby has the umbilical cord still stuck to it. And I'm going to be the mommy and the guys are skinning the meat and throwing them at each other and making any kind. And then so there was this thin line that I walked and then, but I love the art of taxidermy. And he was going to apprentice me at 13, but the, 13 is not the age of apprenticeship. That's too old already. You like to go with the boys and go smoke in the bushes and stuff like that, right? So the age of apprenticeship is he should have take me at 10 when I asked, Dad, I like do this with you. You know, but he's a taxidermist and he's a hunter and we, he always made us eat wild meat. And the bully burgers is the, uh, we had a cow and my dad said, don't name it. It was a calf. And then we named it bully. And like the wild meat, like he would come home and he made sheep stew. So stinking gamey. Like, and then he would, he would make his own hamburger with sheep meat and then mix them in with ground beef. And that's the bully burgers. Like you can still taste it. Like <laughs> that's bully, <laughs> you know. Like, but we would have to bite it, and you know, he would make us taste it. Like, <laughs> but the other wild meat he made, like wild uh, smoked pork, smoked pig, smoked goat, smoked sheep, and then the smoked turkey. Hora, oh no, you know what I mean, but. The Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers is growing up in that, walking that thin line, seeing that kind of beauty and violence in all areas of your life, you know, that it's hard to navigate that childhood. Oh. 
Well, let's talk about your dad a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously have a, a really great relationship um, with your father, and he also um, wrote some memoirs, and you had mm -hmm. shared this with, um, with me early on, but mm -hmm. uh, he is AJA, American of Japanese Ancestry, who mm -hmm. served in the Korean War, mm -hmm. and he went to a, a, a senior writing course, right, at the equivalent of what we have over here as the Kalanoa Senior Center. And he wrote his, his memoirs. And um, tell us about that. So he's like a man of many talents. And one of them he thought was writing. Oops, I mean, you know, I love him. He served on the USS Castor in the Korean War. So, um, but after my books came out, all my uncles, my uncle Sam, my uncle Willie, my dad, you know what? I can't hear you, Lois. Let's see. Hmm. All right. That's weird. I wonder what happened. I can see you, but I can't hear you. It looks like oh, there, there you go. Perfect. Okay. okay. All right. Technical difficulties. We'll edit that I out. Know. <laughs> okay. So we got that he was on the, the USS Castor. Yeah. And then, um, oh, but what was the question before that? Uh, he was on the, oh, he was a taxi his memoirs. Driver. Yeah, taxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then his memoirs. So they thought, oh, she's so dumb, you know, me, right? That I can write stories too. So my uncle Sam wrote from plantation poverty to millionaire success because he went off the plantation and now he's a ukubuku millionaire, the older oldest brother. And then, um, what you call that? Um, I keep losing my train of thought. This is how I really am, you know, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I love it. And then it's he's on the, um, wait, so wait. So, so he, Uncle Sam writes his book and then Uncle Willie writes his book because I'm so dumb and my father writes 400 stories. And so we do this reading together. So we're trying to promote my book. And then he brings his little table and he brings his stapled with duct tape over the staples, which he calls, he published. I said, you're the publisher. You, what you talking about? And he lays out all his books. And you know, I had all my books and da da da. And here she is, ta da da da, right? My father sold out every single copy and I made $25. He made $1,000. Really? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. Because him, he go like this, right? They say, Oh, I want, Harry, you have any extra books on the Wailea Village story you wrote? He says, Oh, I got to check with my publisher first. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I can, you know, so I'll go let my publisher. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's so nailed. <laughs> and then he makes them like he goes to the print shop and then, you know, how they kind of bind it with that binding. Right, right. And then he go put duct tape over. <laughs> he gluing on the I cover in color. <laughs> like, Hey, too much that you don't publish. I want to just say, I'm going to make one book for you when I go home. <laughs> he said, I get $1,000. <laughs> so you read it, right? Yeah. And, you know, what kind of things did he have in there? I mean, it must have been uh, some just just really interesting perspectives of, of being AJA a, a, I, along with stories. I think old people like to read his books because they're uh, like kawaii yeah i mean you know like um adorable kind of like that one old man writing about this kind of stuff and his memories and they also relate to the place they like to see their name where they're from in print it's important you know and then um so that's why he started doing all these short stories but you know that class that he was in in the uh come on uh, Kamana Center in Hilo. He goes sit in the front row, right? And, and then Miyoko Sugano is uh, the teacher. So she's a longtime friend of mine. She said, Do you know your father? I said, Yes. <laughs> First thing he says is, 
hi. He stand up, she said. <laughs> he go, hi, my name is Harry Yamanaka. I'm the father of the author, Lois Ann Yamanaka. Then she sit down. <laughs> then she said, every little remark she makes, and she very carefully edits, he, he disregards it. So, and then she said, he comes back the next week, she said, oh, but Harry, you didn't, oh, that's how I wanted it to be, but she, so I was maybe. his previous editor. And let me tell you, I had to, well, he had dot matrix and he would make them single space and I would annotate small kind. And then when I read the next draft, it's the same thing. Like I sweated profusely. I said, who says that? <laughs> I was walking on the road and it was full of ghosts and I sweated profusely. I said, see it in a different way. <laughs> but he wouldn't. He just, that's well, him. Maybe he's like you and just didn't want to be, uh, you know, you know, always <laughs> going to censor him. <laughs> but he gets but, um, books. Does he? Yeah. yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, do you have a favorite book of the books that, that you've written? Do you have a favorite? Well, you know, writers are always trained to see the current book that they're writing. But if I had to name my favorite, my, to me, my most literary book is Father of the Four Passages, of course, which sold the least amount of books. But I say I put my art and my farts and everything into Father of the Four Passages. I just think it's a beautiful book, but it's a very difficult subject. Mm. So people, you know. And then I really enjoyed my um, foray into historical, creative historical nonfiction. Ooh. Where you have created liberty to, you know, um, to use history as your backdrop to, but not stick to the events of the characters. Which, uh, which what is that? What is some of that? Oh, that one is that called done? Behold the Many. Oh, Behold the Many. And that's one. If you want to read anything that's true as to what happened to me, it's that one. Because our house was haunted when we moved into Kalihi Valley. And I went into this research of Kalihi Valley and what was back there, what attracted artists and musicians and churches. In the Kalihi Valley, I counted seven churches of different faiths. So the, there's something very spiritual about Kalihi Valley that um, I found compelling as a historical backdrop. But the ghosts and all of that stuff, it's all, it's all true. That's what I'll fest to, but nothing else. Okay. Well, I'll have to get that one. And I mean, you've done children's books, you've done adult books, mm -hmm. you've done young, young teen, teen books. Um, tell us about your children's book. My children's book have been um, part of a series with uh, Penguin, Penguin and Random House Books. It's called Make Me a World. So they want to choose books that are representative of all, of not all, but you know, peoples of the world. So my book is called Snow Angel, Sand Angel. How, you know, my dad used to take us up Mauna Kea, but you cannot go up until after the snow stops. So the snowman is like a hard piece of rock. You got to chip it with an ice pick and his head becomes triangular. It's not like on the mainland. And so you never see snowfall. And then it's kind of like a letdown, but that's what we had. But when I went to the mainland, when I was, I think I was 36 when I saw snowfall for the first time. And I did a Mary Tyler Moore. <gasps> And then I was in Boulder, Colorado, Fort Collins, and they showed me how to make snowman. They just go from one side of the yard and they just run and the thing roll. Like, you know, like, it's so easy to make snowman. And then you make with a big ball for the butt, then you roll down and you make the middle and then the head. But when we made snowman, we had to chip the ice like that. And we used to make snow cone, but it was just like eating ice cubes with syrup on top. It wasn't like snow. So it's a book about, um, you know, feeling like you're not part of anything because all you see in pop culture are images of um, other people. 
and we don't even know what snow is. And then so children in my um, school, they, when it comes to the snow questions, they always get it wrong. Like, what is black ice? What should you do if, you know, Kanika was on the road and the car, there was black ice, and then they get them wrong in the sledding questions because we don't have that experience. So the sandy angel is when, uh, well, we have, we can do it here, you know, and we make our sandman. And he's so beautiful because he has coral teeth instead of, you know, and he has a, uh, and our snowman had one ume uh, on his nose and but he has cowrie shell eyes and a beach towel for a scarf and a straw hat and then we make sand angels not snow angels so wow. yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting a, it's, a, it's a, so you, no go ahead sorry oh no so the they took that part out, the part where I said next Christmas when our teacher says we don't make snowman and put them on a window, I'm going to make a sandman. So mine will be brown. You know, like me and not, you know. Right. Well, I mean, so many of your novels talked, you know, speak to um, those ethnic issues uh -huh. and and Lovey wanting, you know, the, the first couple of chapters, she's talking about, about being Shirley Temple. And then you had that whole chapter about the Tony home perms and always trying to be something that mm -hmm. you see, but something that you're not. And you've won a lot of awards. Um, I mean, do you feel a responsibility to be a voice of Asian Americans? I mean, you've won most influential Asian American by a magazine. Do you, do you have that? Do you feel that? You're yeah. shaking your head no. Because the Asian American experience is so varied and so wide that, you know, um, it hasn't happened that way. Like there's a generational token that's going to be somebody that is going to be the window in. And um, the rest of us are just we're, we're we're so unique to where we the circumstances that brought us here you know we're not like canadian the canadian the canadian japanese experience the hawaii japanese experience versus the kotong and it's so different you know so i never i wanted to write a story and not be ashamed of who i was and not feel like i was less than anybody else you know, because that was like a stigma, you know, we spoke pigeon, you're not gonna get nowhere. You're gonna be stuck on this rock. You know, you're going to you're not you're not gonna get ahead. So you better talk standard English. But we we I can go for a little while, you know, and then after a while, if I really want to be honest in my responses, I have to talk in pigeon. But I cannot do like people on the mainland. Sometimes when I give talks or readings, they say, Can you talk in pigeon? And I go, Not to you, gotta be somebody out there that can talk to me. <laughs> you know. Right, you can't just all of a sudden. Yeah, like bring you know, bring it be on. what you're not at that moment. Yeah, and, interesting. And then sometimes I get stuck, like somebody, and I got to the point where I felt so comfortable with my skin. Finally, after so many years of self-flagellation, um, that when people ask me questions and I try to articulate it in standard English. And I cannot, I said, you know what? I gotta answer you in pigeon first. So I will answer you in pigeon. Then if you don't know what I mean, I, I will explain what I mean. So then I'll explain what I mean and I'll t tell the answer in pigeon. And then say, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> they go, yes. Yeah, you know, because the universality of the human experience, love, friendship, it doesn't matter how you say it because those things will rise higher than the, the way that it's told. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's so true. And, and language, I mean, that's a, that's another whole conversation, how mm -hmm. important language is. And, and when you're able to articulate things in mm -hmm. whatever is your own language, right, right, uh, how much right. more personal that is. Mm -hmm. um, is. Is there a special message that you want people to take from, from your 
literature? Is, is it what you've been talking about? Is it that, you know, you are who you are and be, be proud of who you are? Or what, what do you want yeah. people to take away? I especially want, that's why I write in, in that range of um, age, you know, from a picture book all the way to a novel to, you know, and in between I wrote adolescent novels. I'm currently working on a middle grade novel and I'm finished, but my business shut down. I didn't make it through after 20 years. So sadly I have to pack everything up, but hey, I'm having a good day. Um, so I'm writing that and then I'm using a lot of, I mean, borderline scrapbooking, but you know, it's art. It's like shadow. I made shadow boxes for the stories, and but I want every, every generation to see their face, their families, hear their voices in literature because Daryl Lum once so poignantly said, until you see yourself in literature, you don't exist. You, that's how powerful words are. And I took that to heart because all I saw of myself was through the eyes of this wonderful, wonderful woman named Ruth Tabra. But there were no models then, you know, Hawaii legends. And I mean, those were important books because they were on the island that I'm from. And, but to see and hear your family or your auntie and go, oh my God, that's my auntie talking. and or experiences that are very specific. The more specific you are, the more universal you become. So that's who I write for. I want people to see themselves and a facsimile of their neighbors or themselves so that they have a place in literature that they exist, you know. That's beautiful. Um, and I, I think that your, your books speak to um, all ethnicities, really. I think that there is something in there for for everybody, whether or not you are, you know, local or Hawaii or, you know, there is something in there for everyone. And I think it's so interesting where you just said, the more specific you are, the more universal, mm -hmm. um, the more universal it is. Um, so, yeah, you were talking a little bit about the books that you're writing now. Is there is there something big on the horizon? Um, I'm going to stick with this middle grade genre. I'm going to take it for the whole nine yards. It's a, it's a age group that I never wrote to because I have young adult novels and I have adult novels. I have children's books, but I want to write to this gap audience because... What, what age is that for those that who would don't... Be maybe grades four to six, four to seven. Um, that group that right they're gonna hit reading like the outsiders or they still like to read uh, fashion kitty hello kitty fashion kitty and all the graphic novels but something that speaks to that gap group you know there's there's not a lot out there i mean there's a lot but strong kind of formulaic yeah i don't do it my way yeah um you know we, we were talking earlier this week about you being a mentor or you know a role model and you kind of you were very humble and you kind of downplayed it but you know you are a mentor to to the the students that you've taught over the years and you know a real role model is there a piece of advice you've given to your students over the years i mean something that that nugget that that you hope sticks with them i think that goes back to my mother she said that to me, you know, because I didn't know what to do with an English degree. I mean, I was so narrow. I wasn't, because people, I guess the teachers thought that I was going to be on a vocational um, track. So I was tracked that way. But um, my mother told me, if you love them, they will do anything for you. So I always use that, you know, and then my, um, my track record, I would say is 99%, but how much energy it took to love the unlovable and to find that one redeeming quality in every child. Took a lot of hard work. I didn't last very long because I felt like I was burning a candle at both ends, but I don't like to, 
I don't like when teachers talk about, you know, like, oh yeah, uh, you know, I saved this kid, you know, he was heading for and then, well, my mother, uh, when we were a kid, she would bring her students home. So all of the kids that didn't have dads or they were misfits or for whatever reason, they would earn points in her class by doing their multiplication table. And then she had these charts and their reward would be they could stay over at our house and they could camp she would set up the tent in the backyard with them and do cookouts and then they would go Ike fernandez watch movies and they loved her and she loved them she would take them fishing she would do all kinds of stuff with them and so at any given day we would wake up and would have people sleeping on the floor of our living room you know what i mean and like Oh, who's that? And then some, one time I came home and somebody was under my blanket. They went into my room and I said, who's that under my blanket? But that's why my, but her whole philosophy was, you know, love them and take care of them and they will learn. They will learn from you. So. Very special. Way, yeah. And then she was like that her whole career, you know. Oh. What a wonderful mother and, and father. Um, yeah. You well, I don't have. know if she was that wonderful, but she was too much too. But anyway, let's not say that. That's, our, that's another time. Ther that's therapy session. That's your poetry. <laughs> um, so we, I can't believe we're almost at the end of our hour. What I'd like to do is, um, you know, say, say our mahalos to the people viewing, but I'd like to come back to you, Lois Ann, at the end, and maybe you could close us out with another reading or uh, some other, you know, whatever you'd like to close us out with. Um, while you go look for something, I just want to say thank you to everybody who tuned in with us today and a huge mahalo to our um, speaker, Lois Ann Yamanaka. We are so glad that all of you joined uh -huh. us. Um, just to let you know, for those viewing, uh, next Tuesday on our Take Leadership Series, we are going to be inviting uh, President David Lassner on to talk. He's going to be talking oh. about what's going on at University of Hawaii. Yeah. And then next Friday, we have our Women's Leadership panel in conjunction with the U.S. Japan Council, where we're inviting Meredith Ching, Malika Dudley, and Sadine Ota on to talk about the, the fierce, the fabulous, and the feminine. Um, and if you're interested in signing up for any of these things, please go to our website at NB mc.org to sign up for, especially the Lastner one, because uh, we won't be sending out an, an email before that. And we also are closing out the month with Grant Chun. He's the executive director at Hale Mahaolu and Sharon Suzuki on the 29th, the president of Maui and Hawaii County Electric. So again, please check out our website and join us for those as well. And thank you for being here. So Lois, I, I turn it back over to you for You some, know what I'd rather do though? What? I'd rather, um, I'd rather field questions from people if they have questions okay. for me. Let's see if there are any more have come in. We went through a couple of them. Okay. Let's see. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time to send them in. I know we had why the title of the book. Um, while we are waiting for some questions, um, is your is your dad? How's your dad doing? Is he working on? Is he working on any more um, stories mm. to add to his to add to his memoirs? Or his, he uh, um, he suffered a brain injury in 2014. And then um, my mother passed away that year and my grandmother, it was just a really hard year. And he's since been um, slowly declining into dementia, but a miracle happened. He fell last couple of weeks ago and he hit his head. And that's, you know, like, oh my God, he was in the hospital, he had blood poisoning. He hadn't spoken to me in four years because he stuttered and then he, they all have that kind of swallowing thing, you know, like when it comes with dementia and Parkinson's and talking is his stuttering. He woke up the morning he came back from the hospital and he told the caregiver, can you call Lois for me on the phone? And me and him went talk and talk and talk 
for our 15 minutes, I never heard him talk that much. And he talked about current things like COVID and about the caregiver's sons. And then he talked about way past things because sometimes they remember way past things better. But he knew everything. He had forgotten my sisters, my mother, and he only remembered me. And then my sister called me a needy narcissist. Whatever, I told that to my writing friend. She says, aren't we all? Every artist is a needy narcissist. <laughs> and the other thing is people have often called me a racist and I used to try to defend myself. You know what, I am a racist, who isn't? I, 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 to me, I own it now. I just, you know, rather than trying to defend myself, I own it, yeah. I think I'm, um, but I'm gonna tell it how it is. So your job is tell it like yours is. Good, all right, so we got a bunch of questions in and I think okay. the first one is, do you have a little sister like in your poem, The Boss of the Candy? And I know you just referenced a sister, so. I have three sisters, so younger, and we were all born and then within three years, the twins, I have twins below me and a uh, youngest sister. The, I had the, um, the misfortune of my mother forcing me to let my sister uh, live with me after she graduated from, I don't know, I don't know where she graduated, was UH or something. And I went and she, and she didn't pay one bill and then she moved her boyfriend in and I was fielding all the bills. I had only $44 for after I used my teacher's salary to buy food for all of us. I was just so over here with her. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna write one poem about you. And she said, go, go. <laughs> and the boss of the food. There you go. <laughs> so that one is the kernel. It's the truth. Right. But a lot of them are, you know, the truth, the roots, the, I got to make them up, right? But uh -huh. so the, then the joke of the family said, no, do nothing bad to her. I wish you could write her one story about you. <laughs> That's good. Um, here's one. How was the intergenerational reaction to your um, beautiful tattoos in the JA community? Oh, they don't like it. Yeah. They, the one lady, you know, uh, my father called it ugly. And then I went, whatever, you can fix ugly, but you cannot fix stupid. <laughs> he laughed, right? So the but, person just typed in, she's like, they are fabulous. So I just want to let you know that, oh, that the person thank who you. asked the question says they're fabulous. Um, and, <laughs> but then, you know, my, um, I used to go visit my auntie until COVID happened. She's in a nursing home in Aia. And then this old lady would talk about, um, would talk dirt about me in Japanese right in front of me. And she called me this word, I forget the word, but in Japanese it's translated to she's horrid. <laughs> because of my tattoos. I was like, you know what, Myrtle? I was on the edge of thing. Next time Betsy says something to me, I go and rip her. But then I thought, nah, uh, let her have her gossip. You know what I mean? Right. But talk, and I saw my auntie, what did she just call me? And my auntie said, she said, you're horrid. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, said, oh, we God. all we all love them, and so did the person who wrote the question. Okay, two last questions. Um, any advice to new writers for getting their books published? Uh, this is a publishing landscape that has been um, mercilessly PC'd across the board. So you write one or, or it's over PC that you got to have one, one white girl, one Latina, you got to have, you, know, you got to represent every color of the rainbow. And it, it, it just turned. And then, so I have a, a, one of my books, my friend is a little person, but he's my friend. So the term little person, he wants to be called that and identified as that, but he's a dwarf and he's okay with me if I say that, you know, and, um, and he's gay. And I use the word faggot in one of my, in one of my um, books. And I got 
a reading off of my life from one from an editor who said how dare I and da 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 da, da. that's like saying the n word and blah blah I mean it's just a whole publishing new publishing landscape so it's kind of scary yeah. you know interesting yeah. okay um last question and maybe you kind of touched on this earlier but who who do your where do you get your imagination is it from a person is it from from something special inside of you where 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 does your imagination where do your stories come from and who do you contribute those stories to i think uh, kind of a big question you know, my grandma said you know everybody has a gift that's part of it but i think like when i talk to my other artist friends i was born like this and then so the teacher always said okay this is the line everybody march in a line and so we marching and then all of a sudden i going like that i'm going like that i'm going like that and that's been the story of my life so i've been like um i don't have friends because i'm so different and i'm so weird or i don't know and and my artist friends are funky too and i i love it you know like i can I, I just love it but it's hard to understand that this is the way i am so i have this big personality but really i'm so fragile so my mother used to lick the hell out of us. That generation, they never, you guys wasn't scared to give lickings, you know what I mean? It was a fly swatter, the back scratcher, anything you could get your hands on, you just lick your kids, right? Uh, I was part of the receiving end of that generation. But um, my point was that, so I forgot what I was going to say. So maybe all of that made all of that made you who you are and that's where your inspiration yeah she was gonna beat that from. she was gonna beat that out of me like beat that spirit out of me but that that's that's who i was and i was more fragile than my sister all my sisters you know but i had this big outer kind of persona like after this is Paul, I'm oh, in my room and crawl under my bed for all the things I said. You know what I mean? And I'm saying, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, I, I just have to say that I, I, I have enjoyed so much these past um, several months. We've been, yeah. we've been talking about this and you've agreed to come on. And I have, I was actually talking to my mother before this started and I, I find you to be everything that you say you are. You are very you're very quiet yet you're very colorful mm -hmm. and um it's it's been absolutely wonderful getting to know you these thank uh, you past thank few you, you too. months and it's uh it's lovely we everybody on this call has joined because they love your work they want to get to know you more and uh, you've given them a, a oh no you don't <laughs> <into your life. laughs> and where can we get your books? I, I know I got uh, mine from Barnes and Noble, but you're on Amazon, you're on Barnes and Noble, you're all over the place. Yeah, right? I, I, you know, can I make a plea for all writers? Yes. Okay, my plea Definitely. is, okay, so you read my book, you go, wow, I got, you know, this is so awesome, that whatever you think, you say, oh, this is all shit, throw them away then, you know what I mean? I tell people, why do you read my books if you hate me? If you hate me so much, throw in my book, um, but the ones who do, they want to pass it on. Say, oh, I got to give this to my auntie. No, tell Auntie Murdo she got to buy her own copy because that money is royalty to me. But if your family keep passing them around to everybody, not only you're not going to get them back, but I'm not going to get money. <laughs> it's COVID. Okay, cool. so everybody... <laughs> Has to go out and buy buy their books, um, whichever one it is that you want to read or all of them. Go out and get them. Thank you, Lois Ann Yamanaka. You have uh, been delightful. You are so talented, and we really, really thank you for taking time from Thanks all that you are doing in life right me. now thank to do this so for us. Much. Okay. So to everybody else, have a great rest of your weekend. We yep. hope to see you again okay. soon. Be well and stay safe. Yep. Ahui ho. Thank you. Ahui ho.